So if you've, uh, if you've been here the last few weeks, you know that we have entered a new sermon series, the study of Ezra, and uh, to continue that and tell us more about it, I introduce our teaching pastor, Joel Looney. Morning, everybody. So as Brian just mentioned, we are uh, in the book of Ezra. And just to recap, if you haven't been around, Ezra basically takes place at a time in the history of God's people where they've been living in exile in a land that wasn't theirs for about 70 years. They didn't have a temple, so they couldn't really worship the way that they uh, were told that they were supposed to by God. And in that place, in the foreign land, God actually moves on the heart of a pagan king named King Cyrus, who lets the Jewish people go back to their homeland and start rebuilding the temple. And God really makes all of this happen so that worship can happen, right? And so that uh, they can establish this community of worship as they were intended to, right? And what we've been saying is that God does the same thing for us, that God has prepared a place for us to come home and worship. And we've quoted several times Psalm 126 out of the message. It's uh, a psalm that's actually from a special group of ca psalms called the Songs of Ascents. And it's what the Israelites would sing as they kind of were on pilgrimage back to the temple, back to Jerusalem, or perhaps uh, as they walked up the stairs of the temple, right, the steps of the temple. And uh, this is Psalm 126. It says, it seemed like a dream, too good to be true, when God returned Zion's exiles. We laughed, we sang, we couldn't believe our good fortune. We were the talk of the nations. God was wonderful to them. God was wonderful to us. We are one happy people, and now, God, do it again. Bring rains to our drought-stricken lives, so those who planted their crops in despair will shout hurrahs at the harvest, so that those with who went off with heavy hearts will come home laughing with armloads of blessing. And this morning, the sermon is called Second Time Around, right? And so we're talking about this idea of God, do it again, and we often call out to God uh, to come through for us like he has in the past, right? And those of us that have kind of been on the spiritual journey for a while, we can look back at these times that God really came through for us, which helps us when we're in difficult times because we can kind of say, God, do it again. Uh, though sometimes when we say, hey, God, do it again, what he'll say is kind of the same words back to us. He'll call us to do it again, which is what we're saying this morning. God calls us to do it again. And so sometimes you, you do something over again when you didn't get it right the first time. I am the second child in my family. Of course, then there was also a third child, so I guess they kept going there. But uh, there's other times, though, that you do it again, not because you didn't get it right the first time, but because you did do it right the first time, right? But it's just time to do it again. And... One thing marriage counselors will say, for example, is they say, hey, if you want to feel like you did when you first got married, then you should act like you did when you first got married. Uh, so when we first enter into a relationship, we, uh, we are excited and we're going out on dates and we're just putting all our creative juices into how can I make this person like me, right? And how can we have fun together? And that's just the truth is that so much of the what you feel in the beginning stages of a relationship, you feel that way because of the way that you're acting and what you're doing. And so uh, I think about that a lot, even though I'm not even a year into marriage, there's still that sense that, hey, if I want to keep this going on a good trajectory, I need to continue to behave uh, the way I did when it was a new thing. And so I've been in this season of, for me, what's been a personal transition, right? A transition from moving from singleness uh, into marriage, which has been really interesting. It's been fun, but it's been interesting as well. It's been a stretch for me in a lot of different ways. I mentioned some of them last week, but we've also been, and if you've been around a while, you feel this. We've been in a little bit of a season of transition as a church. Uh, different people, you know, moving away, jobs, various things, and of course, uh, coming up, Walter and Susan are going to be um, moving on, and there's a lot of mixed feelings that go along with that. I'm so excited, and I rejoice with them as they move to be closer to biological family, uh, but also mourn as they leave behind church family in that sense. But I also, after going through some of this sadness, what I found is something else opening up in my heart. 
there's there's something stirring. We just said uh, that we started up growth groups again, and I don't know what it is, uh, but for whatever reason, this growth group starting up, at least for me, kind of feels like the first time I ever led a growth group. There's just a sense of excitement uh, and expectation for what God, God's going to do. I don't really have a lot of <laughs> words to uh, I don't have a good maybe explanation for that, but I've talked to a number of different people in the church who feel the same thing, that God is starting something, kind of, a, kind of asking us, hey, do it again. As somebody who's been here at the church in some sense since the beginning, but I came as uh, a teenager, right? And I'm now at the age that a lot of the leaders that I looked up to were when I got here. And what I sense God saying to me is, hey, you've got to do it again. What you saw them doing, that's what you need to do. And there's this sense where I I feel, you know, I need to kind of recommit, step up, and kind of uh, do some of those things that I still kind of think that one of the real leaders is supposed to do. (laughs) Because a part of me still sees myself, you know, in kind of that teenage uh, sub-adult realm. And God just telling me, hey, Somebody's got to do it again, and you're a somebody. <laughs> and by the way, you are all somebodies that are here this morning. And uh, if this is, if you're new here, this is a great time to be a new person because there's some space opening up and there's some new things happening. And this is a great time to be new or renew, okay? If you've been around for a while, God, I think, also wants to renew you in that sense. So something's stirring, something's moving, uh, and this is our prayer. Hey, God, do it again, and then this is his call back to us, do it again. And that's, as we talked about last week, a lot of that is sacrifice, right? That God is asking us to be the folks that are going to walk the 900-mile journey back home to start rebuilding, right? To start over, that you would have the vision to see something that is not there yet, In some cases, it's something that used to be there and no longer is. And in other ways, and at other times, it may be something that has never existed in this church or maybe anywhere that God is calling you into. And so it's a call to vision, to new vision, to new life, but that will require some new sacrifice. The good news is is there's joy on the other side of that sacrifice for you and also for the people around you. And so each Sunday when we come here, Again, I think God honors that sacrifice of time, and anything that you give to God, he will uh, bless and finds a way to multiply, right? Sometimes it changes forms in the multiplication. Sometimes we give money and we get back uh, some sense of emotional blessing or whatever else, but there's always this uh, abundance that comes out of sacrifice, and each Sunday we ask God to do it again, and again, his response, do it again. That's what we're talking about this morning, the second time around, right? Some of you may be just coming back to church after you've been out for a while, maybe even some of you for a number of years. And it's the second time around, and we say, God, do it again, and we trust that he will because we know that he's done it before, and he's the same God that he's always been. So this morning, uh, thankfully, though Raymond just had the flu, he has uh, recuperated uh, because he it was just the normal flu. He hasn't been in China, and he doesn't drink Corona. So we're safe on, on that sense. So it's, it's my pleasure to welcome to the stage our senior pastor to the pulpit and ask him to do it again, Raymond McDonald. Gracias. Oh, cuidado, mi amigo. It's muy malo. Well, it's awesome to be here. Yes, I am well over the flu, so you don't need to be concerned. I uh, spent last week out mainly to make sure that you would know that. Uh, I happened to got sick on a Saturday night, so I missed one, and then I went ahead and missed the other just for your comfort uh, and the fact I couldn't get out of bed. But, hey, it's good to be here. Good to see you. I want to thank everyone who came out. Uh, we had a men's meeting that went down to Houston, uh, and I want to thank you for going. I, I, spoke, uh, I spoke at that, so I've done this again since the flu. So there you go. And, um, and I you know, just want to thank you for being here today. I'm very excited about Ezra. And it's been very difficult because we got into Ezra, and then, bam, uh, I was out for two weeks. But part of that is this sense of knowing 
that there is a team of people and there is a group of people who come and they're praying for you and you know when you're not here that they're with you and praying for you and that life carries on and not everything went down the tubes because I wasn't here. Thank God it would have went down the tubes had I been here. But the, the sense is community that cares and blesses you. And it's a great day to be here because, uh, you know, I would hear stories of, oh, wow, guess who was here last week? They're not generally here, but they were here last week, and I was upset that I missed them and to get to see them. But this week I get to see some folks that I haven't seen in a while, and I'm so excited to see Jackie and Francie Hell's always a blessing to me. People whose names were on that list, the list a couple of weeks that was showed up here of folks who were here in those days who got things rolling and powerfully involved. And, um, and I wasn't here to see that. When I read that list, I just started kind of weeping at home. Uh, it meant so much uh, to me. But uh, as we continue this week talking about transition and what we do, let's go back to Ezra and let's see what's going on there. And remember, something that happened so long ago still has impact for us today. And if that, from Ezra's time, can impact us, certainly... Those who've come and who've been here from the beginning have impact on us. So let's just say, come Holy Spirit, be here, be through the words, but more importantly, let your spirit touch even beyond the words and call us into the deep decisions of our life that take us out of the comfort and bring us into the sacrifice of what it means to be a people of the living God. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's start with first uh, on Ezra verse uh, 7 in chapter 3. He says, they gave money to the masons and carpenters. So let me just start, say today, if you're a mason or carpenter, let's pass the offering plate and get it going. No, that wasn't it. Ja Jackie was hoping for that one. But let's go. Masons and carpenters, they gave food and drink and olive oil to the people of Sidon and Tyre so they would bring cedar logs by sea from Lebanon to Joppa, uh, Joppa as authorized by Cyrus, king of Persia. Now you say, what is going on here? Well, first of all, let's remember that they're trying, and we saw this last week, trying to tie the second temple to the first temple in the sense that they're using the same language that was used for Solomon's temple for this temple as well. Matter of fact, it ties in a lot with Isaiah uh, 60, which said that foreigners will rebuild your walls and their kings will serve you. And though in anger I struck you, in favor I show compassion. Remember, they had been taken out and uh, to captivity because of their sin, and now returning. And it says, The glory of Lebanon will come to you, the juniper, the fir, and the cypress together to adorn my sanctuary. They are aware of the prophecies that preceded them, and they're, you will continue to see that language. Tim, you're like going, why do I care? Because I want you to understand that they're trying to say that the second time around, is just as significant as the first time around, and the same praises and blessings of God are with the second time around as the first time around. And just throwing that in there real quick, saying to you that that's important for us to remember because often we think it's only good the first time. Meaning when we plant churches, we remember those church planters. When we plant a nation, we think of all the pioneers, the people who came on the boats. But I will say to you today that what you do for your nation today is just as important as those who sailed on those boats and came and settled. Because as Paul would say, I know that the work that started in you, God's going to bring it to completion to the time of Jesus Christ. When he said that, did he think all those people were going to live until Jesus came? No, because the first part of that was him saying, thank you for your partnership in the gospel. That when we start something, we know even when we're gone that others are coming after us to continue the good work we started on the foundation that was laid and they continue it on. Does that make sense what I'm saying to you today? Now, why am I saying that? Because often when we see a foundation, we come into a building, come into an existing church, we begin to think, I'm so glad everything is done. Now I can come and just sit here and be a part of things. And that is true. That might last a while, but it won't last forever because the truth is we're always in this place of seeing the temple built in a way that's there. Well, as you continue on and you see this here, it says, in the second month of the second year after their arrival at the house of God in Jerusalem. I want to stay, listen to this second time around. They went in the second year, the second month. This is happening. It says, Zerubbabel, son of Shealtiel, 
Joshua, son of Jozadak, and the rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, and all who returned from captivity to Jerusalem began to work. Now, first of all, Zerubbabel's name there, you got to love that name. Who, who has seen a kid named Zerubbabel Hill recently? You know, you don't, you don't see Zerubbabel's name cast around, but you'll see that name in prophecy a lot. It was prophesied that Zerubbabel, was going, who was of the Davidic line, a king, a governor, was going to come back and lay the foundation of this temple when they returned from Babylon. It was prophesied. And sure enough, here's Zerubbabel. He's not getting a lot of fanfare uh, here in the book of Ezra. They don't say he's a governor or anything like that. They're putting him in the mix of things. But they want you to know this here, Phil, that the Davidic line of all God's promises are coming true here in the second temple. Do you capture how difficult this was for these people? Their temple had been raised and burned to the ground. The great temple that Solomon had built, it no longer existed. They had been living for 70 years plus in a foreign nation. They've been allowed to return to rebuild a temple that a king had built with all of his power. Yes, they had the blessings of the king of Persia, but they didn't have a lot more than that. And yet they're coming back to rebuild something. This isn't an easy thing. Now, last week, they begin the sacrifices, right? Joel talked about that because we start with sacrifices even before we lay the foundation of anything. Any of those who were there in the early days remember the sacrifices we made early before we ever built anything. But I would say to you, you continue with your sacrifices all the time. And I look around you and see the sacrifice of your lives that is in this building right here. So they begin that work. And so the whole Israelite community takes responsibility in building this temple. And they appointed Levites 20 years old and older to supervise the buildings of the house of the Lord. Joshua and his sons and brothers and Cadmiel and his sons, descendants of Hadaviah, another cool name, and the sons of Hinnadad and their sons and brothers, all Levites, joined together in supervising those working in the house of God. Now, these appointed Levites were there to supervise because if you look at the, again, go back to the Levitical law, it was their job to make sure things were done right and done in a holy way. Now, you sit back and sit, hear all these things, and you're going, what does this have anything to do with me? Well, I will say this here. They were following the ancient prescription for how worship was to be done and how things were to be built. Now, for us today, we'd sit back and say, that's just ridiculous. We don't need ancient prescriptions to do anything. We, we, the, what is old is old. This is new. Let's be culturally relevant. Let's shave the sides of our head and grow it on top. Let's be millennial as we can be. But many of us can only grow hair on the sides of our heads, so we're going to stick with that prescription. Um, true story, uh, as they were trying to cure MRSA, they could not find how to cure this horrible disease. If anyone's been in the hospital or had someone in the hospital, you would know MRSA disease is a, it's like a flesh-eating disease. It gets there, and that's one of the biggest fears you have when someone goes to the hospital is to get this disease that cannot be cured. And as they went through this uh, trying to cure MRSA, they found a woman who was into ancient manuscripts, and she went back and found a poultice that, a poultice that could be made to cure these type of skin diseases. Now, it's ridiculous. Who does this kind of stuff? I mean, it had leeks, boiled garlic, and all kinds of stuff in it. Bat wings, I don't know what it had in it. But they actually took the old ancient prescription and boiled it and did it and put it on MRSA, and it cured 90% of the MRSA that was there. To this day, they don't know what in it that was the cure all or anything that was there. Instead of writing off the ancient prescriptions, they said, well, let's see. Maybe so it must have worked for something if they used it. And for us, as we come back and we look at what we begin even our roots on, often we can write off those ancient prescriptions, those ancient ways of worship as old and useless, James. You remember some of them. You grew up in the vineyard. You remember all those things. And we often can sit back and say they're not that important to us and they don't mean anything. But there are traditions and elements of worship that may not seem relevant for us today and purposeful, but it connects us back to people and we see that it was usefulness. Number one, let me say this one here. The ancient reason of building a foundation for a temple was that people would come to the temple and worship. 
The ancient reason we planted churches, and it's not that ancient, but we'll call it ancient, is because we believe there was a place for people to come and sit together and worship God. And this flies in the face of what a lot of people think today is why do you need a church when you have the World Wide Web? I don't even know you call it the World Wide Web anymore, but you got the Internet. You can go on there, and you know you can blog all day long. You can watch Joe Lofstein on TV. You've got no reason to be here. So the, the, we often think, this is, why do I need to listen to someone speak when God's speaking to me? And we go through these things. I want to say that it was then, and I think it stands today now, that God has a purpose for us to come to worship together and interact together. There's power in that that brings our lives together. There's more than just learning that's going on here today. You're learning from each other, loving each other, being here. Your attendance t- means something to the person. You're being in a seat. Bring something to somebody that doesn't happen when you're not here. And that God knows that, and he's put you here, and you're purposeful. And if you need a purpose to be here or feel unpurposeful, we'll let you clean the toilets at least to the back, whatever it takes to get you there. But the thing is, there is a purpose that we come together, and it's meaningful to one another. And we start with just that. But let's go back to the ancient ways we did. Sing it. We come in to sing songs. Some of you saying, well, why do we need songs? Is that just a warm-up for the, for the word? We don't need to sing. We don't need that. This is ridiculous. Let's smoke cigarettes. Let's go out. So whatever, you know, that what we do. And the thing comes to this here. Worship has always been a time where we come and lay our hearts before God. And allow him to speak to us and begin to open up. And that we begin to express ourselves in song. Now, in times that before, you maybe you sing. Some of you came from a Pentecostal background where you would sing in the, in the spirit. Uh, I remember going to the vineyard in uh, spring and they would sing in the spirit. And I'm like, what, what, come on. Really? This sounds like a bunch of cats in a dryer. I don't know what's going on. Another one that got me a lot, I'll never forget, is, is you know, this, the, the, I was at the vineyard. They would speak in tongues. I'm like, come on. And I would I'd just get angry. I remember my wife one time, we were at a vineyard event, and um, Don Williams was speaking. He said, why don't you come down and pray for these people? And if you want to, uh, why don't you come pray for them in tongues? And Teresa looked at me and said, why do they do that? It's just so ridiculous. Do we really need that? This is, and I said, I, I don't know. So anyhow, we came down and prayed for him. But the next morning, she was at church, and she went down for prayer. And she went down. There was a lady there uh, uh, who prayed for her. And she came back to me and said, hey, if you see her at work the next day, why don't you tell her that she prayed for everything that was on my heart and all the things in my life, whatever was bothering her. And I went, and I told her, and when I told this woman that, she goes, that's so weird. And I said, why? She goes, because I prayed in tongues. That's the only way I prayed. How does she even know what I prayed for? Uh, the point is, my wife brought, was brought into healing and interpretation of tongues and all these things when she was like, oh, I hate that stuff. And yet it brought some, like the ancient pulses had something that brought the healing and power of God that we don't understand fully, but that we engage. And when it comes to thinking, do we really need to pray for people all the time? We got doctors now. Back in the days, they prayed for sicknesses because they had nothing. I want to say to you today, it still works today, praying for the sick. It's still powerful today to lay hands on someone, to lay hands on strangers, to come in and to be, to come in and to, and to say, Let me, can I pray for you? And when we started this church, that's the way we did things. Hey, can I pray for you? The pizza person would come over, and they'd have a bad knee, and we'd pray for their knee. The doctor would come over, and his wife would tell us about how their show horse was sick, and we would pray for the show horse. And, of course, the show horse was healed. So uh, these things are real. Are you with me this morning? Just do the same thing. I want us to understand these things and how important they are. The second time around values tradition and builds upon the past. We don't throw it out. We don't sit back and go, well, there you go. That, that was then, this is now. It is. There's a new way of things. There's a new way. We, we got power. I don't even think they do PowerPoint anymore. This is old style. They, they probably got something a lot better than this. I'm sure they do. And we'll find out what it is. Let us know what it is. Tell Ashley she'll get it done. I'm sure she will. But I want us to understand that we look at these things, we evaluate them, but we don't throw them out. We don't throw out prophecy. 
that when we begin and people would come out in, the, in this congregation during worship and prophesy, we still value that. Recently, uh, I think Joe uh, gave us a prophecy a couple of weeks back. Karen uh, uh, Watts was here. I encourage you to understand, let that spirit of the prophetic fall upon us here and that it retain. We don't throw those things out. They're not done. We didn't get here. Oh, well, we're here now. We don't need that. We need that. We need all of that. We need to move with the spirit to come and fall. We see people here falling in the floor down here. We didn't understand it. We let them fall. We stared at them. I'll never forget praying for Ben Day. This is back when the stairs were here. It was on a Sunday night and prayed for him. He wanted to quit smoking, and I prayed for him, and he fell on the stairs. His arms were expanded. He laid there, and I was so embarrassed. I'm like, people are going to think. We said, he looks like Jesus on the cross laid out here on the stairs. And I just went on and started speaking. Later, he got up and said, why did you shove me down like that? I said, I didn't shove you down. You was embarrassing me the heck. I'm trying to get you up. Looked like he's trying to be Jesus, a superstar, you know. And I just, man, praying in home groups. And I'll never forget Walter and Susan falling on my floor and me thinking Walter was dead. The train would go by and shake the whole house, and we'd say, How come, Holy Spirit? It was great. And, um, you know, how about things like this? How about those idiots who do Sunday school? That's old hat. Is it? Is it something we can look at to move forward? Would that be something that we used to do Sunday night worship the last Sunday of the month? I don't know. I'm thinking of just coming back, meeting here in the cafe and saying, who wants to join? Because it was a time of saying, come Holy Spirit. And we prayed for the sick. And we, and we waited on prophetic utterances and things of that nature. These are things that are the past, they're the evening, our home groups. Oh, it's passe. People don't want you in their homes anymore. We stopped that. But what we didn't realize is that people find comfort going into people's homes. That when you walk into someone's home and you have a meal that you feel a part of the family. And that's a whole lot different than just getting a teaching. You actually get something. And what we didn't realize is that those leaders that we saw come back on those lists in Ezra weren't leaders because they taught good teaching. They were leaders because they were leaders of clans and they took care of people. And that it was people who took care of people who were the leaders. But John Wimber used to say, I know you're a leader because people are following you. And that these people would give their lives to one another. And then when someone was out, they reached out to them because they missed them. Something that can't be done from an upper pastoral point of view. It's just too many people. That You were clan leaders. You cared for people. You brought them in your home. You loved them. You called them when they were sick. You called them when they were missing. You spoke into their lives. And sometimes you ruined their lives. But welcome to leadership. Welcome to leadership. This was the way we did things. Jesus looked at traditions and laws which came before him. He said, you know, don't think I come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've come to abolish, I haven't come to abolish them, but fulfill them. And, guys, I'm saying, how do we fulfill the prescriptions that were ancient? The ancient boundary lines are there. Can we come back and recapture? Is there anything wrong with recapturing and applying for new today? We can't be what we were before. We don't want to be. We want to be what we are going to be now. But to throw out everything that ever happened before and say that was stupid, pardon my French, is stupid. Would you agree with me? Let's evaluate. Let's be real. Let's stand up and be those clan leaders that are there. Folks that, you know, you ask people, what got you into the church? I mean, what touched you? And I'll never forget those early days. And they'd say, well, pastor, we love you. But it was Jackie Hales who greeted me at church and what he said to me. I heard that so many times. It wasn't here that made the difference. We didn't come in here. Many in our age would come in and say, let me hear your theology, and I'll look at your community. But today people say, let me see your community, and then I'll listen to your theology. I want to know I can be loved. I want to know I can belong. I want to know someone cares. And then you should listen to theology too. But I'm just saying, there's an important part. 
of that that's there. Second part says, when the builders laid the foundation of the temple, this is when they laid, they laid the foundation of the temple and the priests and their vestments and their trumpets, again, some of the ancient stuff, they had the clothes and stuff. And the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with symbols, took their places to praise the Lord as prescribed by David, king of Israel. Again, you'll see this prescription that's there. And the issue is that when they laid this foundation, it was a change of things. It was a way of saying God is no longer mad at us and done with us because he took us into captivity. But when we laid that foundation, it was God's way of saying, I've relented, I've forgiven, come and start anew. And for some of us as individuals understanding this here today, that you're laying a foundation of your life today by just being here. You're coming in and saying, I'll start in worship. I don't know what else to do. When I showed up at the church in my life, man, I was still doing all the quote-unquote bad stuff. But showing up was powerful because I walked into a community that loved me and began to walk with me and said, you're here. Because what I'm saying to you, that the individual and the corporate join together, that when you come and begin to lay the foundation of something, Something foundationally is being laid in you. And you get involved and you start going at touching people's lives, and all of a sudden you realize that, hey, if I'm destroying people's lives by the things I'm doing, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to be a restorer, not a destroyer in my life. And, man, I'm speaking that to you heavily because I was out for me, man, out for me. And for the first time in my life, I felt what it was like to be out for someone else, to be a leader, to care for others when my needs weren't even tended to. That foundation is being laid in lives here today. And it promises to see the future glory be just as great or more so than the second. It, pro it portends greater things as we come and begin to lay things down, as you begin to lay ministries, as you begin to do things, as you begin to say, this is the beginning of something. I want to be on the beginning of something, as Joel said, this is a great time to be new. But it's a great time to be old, too, and to say, I need to be renewed and brought into this place that we're there. With praise and thanksgiving, they sang to the Lord, He is good. His, his, his love toward Israel endures forever. And that word love in Hebrew means this covenantal thing of, I've got a covenant with you. I'm not done with you. Vineyard Church at Conroe, I'm not done with you. I called you to be here. I put you in this place, a unique call to be in a unique place. I'm not done with you. I'm not done with you because you came over from another church and you were hurt and you're here now and you're just sitting and, 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 and no, this is foundational. I'm not done with you, he would say. I'm not done because I still believe in worship. And I still believe that God's got a call on his people into worship. This is fantastic in the sense that, that they would come into this. And the temple, like the tabernacle before it, was understood as one of God's dwelling places. It's where God would dwell among the Israelites. And this was important since the foundational concept of, of the covenant of Israel was there. But this whole point that existed with Israel was this here, is we're coming to worship in this place. Capture this. Because God is here. And when we worship God in this place, that worship goes out and fills the world and beckons those who are hurting and alone to come and join us in this place. Now that begs us the question. Did we come here to capture the community? Or did we first come here to worship God and invite the community to enjoy something God was doing? And I think that's an important thing. Because if it's just about community, we'll do just about anything to get community. But if we're not worshiping God and we're not meeting God here, we're not inviting them into anything they can't get somewhere else. And we're going to get new pew pads in the next month here. They're, on, they're in, on the truck coming. But I still don't think that people are going to come here just to sit on new pew pads. We're doing a lot to fix up the building even as we go through Ezra. That's very important. Thank you for those that came out and worked on the playground, namely 
Phil coming with his, Phil on his tractor. Thank you for all the work that you've done, Mike Turner, and, and, and we're continuing to renew, but it doesn't matter what we do to this place. Worship. I give up. People used to raise their hands in worship. What kind of idiots are those? The kind I like. The kind that say, yes, come, Lord, fill this man up. I need you. I need you bad. Come, Holy Spirit. When we say come, Holy Spirit, we don't mean just come, Holy Spirit. We mean come, Holy Spirit. I need that here, man. And I know you got it together, but I don't. I had nine days of laying on my back, questioning everything I've done in my life and what was its purpose and what was it going to. Because you can only watch so much Netflix, unless you're my wife. But <laughs> she likes it. The point is, no matter what we do, when you get quiet like that, the Spirit will come start knocking on the door. Raymond, you're not done. You're not done. You know, in the beginning, we start talking about the foundation, laying something new here, getting it there. I'm calling you to commitment in your life, to make this a commitment in your life, because you're laying the foundation that brings people into something where their lives are changed and their families come and they find this place where there's an evenness that comes to life, a peace that comes to life, the, the promise of healing, restoration. People coming in on the third marriage going, if this one fails, my life is over. No, it's not going to fail. We can't take care of everything that happened in the past, but we can come and meet you here and the Lord will deal with the past and bring you into a place where you're at. You came out of prison you know what? Thank God you're here today. You're here today. You came with your addictions. You came to the right place today. We are in a place saying, thank you, Lord. I want to worship you. I want more and more of you. In the early days, this is what went on. You showed up and said, hey, we need you to do something. Ah, uh, ah. Uh. I'll never forget Randy Watts when I first became a youth pastor. I invited him to go on a, on a trip with me to take 40 of us snow skiing to Park City, Utah. Seth, you remember that one there. He was over there a while ago. Yeah, and, and so the point is, I'll never forget we were having a conference, and I said, hey, Randy, the Lord's moving on that kid. Lay hands on him and pray for him. And I remember the look on his face. Later he told me, I'd, I'd never prayed for anyone before. Because we didn't just say, hey, uh, how are you with prayer? Pray for that person. Okay. We grabbed you up and said, come on, you're going to do something for God. You're here. Let's do it. I'm not looking for you to get perfect because you're not going to get it. I'm not looking for you to get all the training because you're not going to get it all before you get started. Get started, then get it. Let Lord do it to you and then let him do it through you. And sometimes he does it through you and then starts doing it to you. Would you agree with me today? And some of you are saying, I'm in this place. I want to play. I want to play. I want to say this here. You're waiting for permission to play. I give you permission. Come play. Get involved. Do we have teams and things of that nature? Yes, we do. Do we have training? Yes, we do. But I don't want you thinking you can't play because the Holy Spirit knows how to teach and to do and to move. Are you with me this morning? That gum, I had a lot, two weeks laying on my back. I got a lot of things to say. Get off my chest. Obviously. You see, the second time around can even be more glorious than the first. And I want to tell you, that means a lot because we saw some glorious things here. And I believe we're going to see glorious things again and more so starting today, starting tomorrow. And I want you to believe in those things and what's there. If you're done and you're washed out, thank you for being here today. But I'm not going to quit leaning on you. I'm not going to quit leaning on you and say, this is the time that we start and begin to identify leaders, clan leaders, those who love, those who move out and say, come on. Come on. Chicken, fried pie, Captain Crunch, and a carton of bologna meal. It's Christian Tourette's. And, and you know, it just, you know, Haggai 2 says, this is what the Lord Almighty says, in a little while I want more 
Shake the heavens and the earth, the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and what is desired by all nations will come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord. The silver is mine, the gold is mine. The glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. And in this place I will grant peace, declares the Lord Almighty. The Presbyterians met here for 60 years, and they turned around and handed the keys to us to meet here. We've been meeting here almost 20 now. And I think we'll move on and do 20 more. And then we'll talk about 20 more after that if the Lord doesn't come before. I think the Lord will come before the Cowboys go to the Super Bowl. But I think it was just, some of you have hopes of that first. But I just say come and invite you in. The last one says, all the people gave a great shout of praise in the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. I said, all the people gave a great shout of praise. It was something like, praise the Lord! Woo! And why did they do that? Because it, when they brought the Ark of the Covenant in the first time, they shouted to say, the king is here. Now, they don't have an Ark of the Covenant this second time around. They never caught that again, in spite of what you've seen on uh, Discovery. They've not found that. But they were saying, the king is here. And Mike, the king is here. And the shouts of praise were fantastic that day. Fantastic. But many of the older priests the Levites and the family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid, while many others shouted for joy. No one could distinguish the sound of the shouts of joy from the sound of weeping because the people made so much noise and the sound was heard far away. Now, some think these older folks are crying because they're so happy, but the Hebrew word that's there is one of mourning. Stormy, it's not that they're crying because, oh, look, it's going to happen again. Why do you think they were crying? One, I would think, would be regret and remorse. Look what, how much time was wasted, what we lost to get back to this place. I think another one's this here. Look at the people who aren't here, who were here before. Oh, for them to have seen it again. I'm telling you, it's hard when you're saying, yeah, let's do it. Because you know and remember the past. You remember the pains. You remember the things that are lost. Those are gone. But I want to tell you, that is part of the here, not yet. When Jesus comes, there will be no more weeping. And all that will be laid down, but he's not come yet. He's come again that the power may be here. He's come but until he comes again, you're going to have weeping and regret and remorse. But you don't have to live in shame, and you don't have to live with this. Understand that if you will rejoice, you can deal with the regrets. And if you think you're going to rejoice and not have some sense of regret or some sense of loss, well, you're wrong because worship encompasses the full gamut of emotion. That's why some people cry while some people are laughing. And let the emotion well up in us. We're not an emotionless worshiping community. We never were. You can see it right there. And we never should be. So when we say come Holy Spirit, expect for some to feel it this way and some to feel it the other way. It's hard for me because I miss the ones I love. And I know some have left come back and visit, some will be gone and we won't see them. And it's hard to be the one left behind. It's hard to be the last camper when everyone goes home. But more campers are coming. And we're going to continue the good work of those who came before us. Amen? The second time around includes the full spectrum of emotion and experience in worship. It has to. It did in the beginning. It wasn't easy in the beginning. Believe me, in the beginning, when you plant a church, you have churches that were shutting down all around here, and you'd have a wave of people come from one church and try this one out. 
their clan leader would sit with them. They'd be here for a little bit. You'd love them, and they'd do what generally those groups do. They moved on to the next church, and you lost them. But there comes a time when God says, knuckle down, get ready to build what I'm calling you to build. Now, we're going to be sending out people even as we do this. I think it's next Sunday we're going to be sending out the Sanders who are going to go plant their church. And I love them. They've been here a year, and they've been a lot to me. And I hate sending them out. I hated sending out Joel and, and, and Danelle. I hated sending out Brian and Alana. I hated out sending out the Kalers. I hated sending out the Huffs. I want us all to be here. But people move on, and they take the leaven, and they take it and let it explode and grow new bread, new life other places. And that's something that if you don't have some people that you're missing because you sent them out, then you're not doing what you're supposed to do. You're going to miss your kids when they grow up and move out. Yeah, I'm like Mike. I shake my head. No, I won't. But the, the point is, if they're still living with you when they're 40, and I know this, you're going to wonder what you did wrong. But you'll love them, and you'll miss them, and you'll see them at Christmas. But let's continue to worship in that way. Love must be sincere. Hate what's evil. Cling to what's good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never lack in zeal, but keep spiritual fervor. Serving the Lord, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. We see that in Romans 12. But remember, we must rejoice and believe even as we're moving through our pain and our regrets. Bless those who persecute you. Do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. And do not be proud, but be willing and associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. These words mean so much to us because we're rejoicing and we're moving into the gamut of relationship, even as we're reaching out, loving people. You can't love people and not get bit. Would you stand with me now?